Welcome to the Leadership Learning Webinar Series. Today's topic is Getting to the Heart of the Generation Gap. I'm your host, Laura Paley, and I'm Director of Student Services here at Lake Forest Graduate School of Management. This series provides monthly learning on relevant business topics, and it is hosted by Lake Forest Graduate School of Management. Lake Forest is an independent, accredited institution with almost 70 years of experience providing business education to working professionals in Chicagoland and beyond. We do this through our MBA program, graduate level certificates, and corporate training and development, all delivered by our 100% business leader faculty. Today, we are especially grateful for the sponsorship and generosity of our client and longtime supporter of the school, Trustmark and the Trustmark Foundation. Trustmark provides access to a full spectrum of flexible benefit solutions, including health plan administration for self-funded employer groups, payroll deducted voluntary products, group medical benefits, and health and fitness management programs. We're able to bring this webinar to you on a complimentary basis as a result of Trustmark's support. Before we move into the program, I'd like to take a few moments to go over how you will interact with your presenter today. During the program, you'll be invited to participate in polls, chats, and respond using annotation tools. The polls will pop up on your screen and are pretty self-explanatory. The annotation tools can be found in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. You'll be using the arrow and pencil or marker functions up here, which can be used by clicking on the marker or pencil. Go ahead and select your color, and you'll see me circle what the annotation, where the annotation tools are located and how you can use them. You can also click on the pointer function, drag your mouse to where you want to put your pointer, and go ahead and click. And you'll see that appear on your screen now. The emoticons are located right over here. You can see where there's a raise hand and a yes, no function. You can see those appear and you may be asked to use those throughout. The emoticons are located there, and the present, like I said, the presenter will prompt you to use them throughout the hour. If you have questions or comments, many of you have already used the chat function. It is found down here at the right-hand bottom of the screen. If you chat a question or comment, please, be used, please use the drop-down menu and select panelists, host panelists, and presenters so that we might see your comment before submitting. All questions and comments will be addressed at the end of the program. Last but not least, please be sure that you are muted and that your video is turned off for the entire program. That will help us to avoid unnecessary distractions during the hour. Okay, let's get ready to go. All right, I, with a couple of additional comments, please close all other applications. This can help you to increase your bandwidth for an easier listening and video experience. Our presenter, Robin, has also asked that you have a paper and pen ready for and good old-fashioned paper and pen exercises early in the program. Once you've closed your other applications and are ready to go, please click the raise your hand emoticon. I'll take a moment here to see where everybody is. See a lot of hands coming up, which is wonderful. So it looks like we're ready to move into our program. All right, let me introduce you to today's presenter, Robin Thompson. Robin is a leadership consultant. She is, has experience as vice president at an Oregon university, and she's a faculty member at Lake Forest Graduate School of Management. Robin was very shy growing up. In college, she signed up for a course designed to help shy people interact and actually got kicked out of class for talking too much. She published her first book on achieving life balance. It is titled, as you'll see here on the screen, No Stress to No Stress. And according to Robin, writing this book caused her more stress than anything she's ever done in her life. With that, please help me welcome Robin Thompson, speaking with a little bit of a Southern accent. Robin, take it thanks, away. Um, okay, thanks so much, Laura. Yeah, I hear that I do have just a little bit of a Southern accent. And you know, it's funny because people usually guess that I'm from Texas. And when I tell them it's further east and further north than that, I get the deer in the headlights look because people are afraid I'm going to give them a geography lesson about the states east of the Mississippi River. <laughs> Actually, I'm from a small town in southern West Virginia, but where I live now is in southern Oregon in a little town called Klamath Falls. We're about 10 miles north of the California border, and you might have heard or seen Portland, Oregon is green and lush because it rains a lot. 
but we're in the rain shadow of the Cascade Mountains. So that's where I'm calling in from today. So what we're going to talk about is this generation gap. And I got really interested in this topic when I was Vice President of Development because we had foundation board members who were older than 70 years old. But then we had student employees who some of them were still teenagers. And when I saw the differences in how they interacted with each other and the people on my staff who went all the way from being baby boomers down to being Gen Z, I knew that I needed to learn more about how to not only manage them, but how to help them work together better. So I've done a lot of research on this topic, and I, I really found it, find it fascinating. So I, I hope you do too. So today what we're going to discuss is how our past influences where we are going. But also, what motivates and demotivates us, and how do these differences affect how we communicate in the workforce, and, and how does it affect us today and in the future? And then give you some tips to help you get at the heart of this generation gap. And then what can you do to be more generationally sensitive? And so as we look at the way that the generations either communicate or don't communicate, there is a common thread that as we go through today, I'm going to ask you with each of the, the different generations, what might that thread be? And then we're going to bring it all together at the end. Well, so I turned my video on in the beginning because I wanted you to see that, yes, someone did get out of West Virginia with all their teeth. Well, this one, no, I'm just kidding. But in the interest of bandwidth, I am going to turn my video off for the rest of the program, but you'll know I'm still here. So um, you'll, you're going to need that pen and paper that we talked about earlier. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is just put that paper down in front of you, put the pen in the hand you typically write with. It's much harder with the other hand. And I'm going to give you some simple directions, and I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and keep your eyes closed throughout this. Okay, so we're ready to go? Eyes closed. I'd like you to draw the outline of a house, just the simple outline of a house. And now you have a tree in your yard, if you would draw that tree. Oh, yeah, you've got two windows in that house, if you draw those two windows. And now you've got a bird's nest in your tree. Oh, I forgot. You've got a door in between those two windows in your house. Oh, 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 yeah, and there's a bird that's flying halfway between the house and the tree. And last but not least, you have three birds in your bird's nest with their mouths open waiting to be fed. <laughs> you can open your eyes now and take a look at your drawing and see how you did. Well, if I was there with you, I would probably say to some of you whose drawings look pretty good, are you used to working in the dark? <laughs> But other ones, you probably have windows in the yard and um, your birds might be on the ground. So what I'm going to ask you is, as you think about this activity that we just did, what would have made this task easier and more successful? Now, besides opening your eyes, because we all know that opening your eyes would have made it easier. So if you can just chat in your chat box, what would have made this activity easier for you if you would have still had your eyes closed. And Laura, I don't know that I can see those. Oh yeah, I can. Good. So um, thanks, Kristen. So instructions being organized together. Good, good. Um, I see some other ones coming in. Oh, so to provide all the components of the house at one time. Good. All the requirements up front. Oh, not lifting your pencil. That's creative. Yeah, um, completing the house at once, yep. Okay, having somebody else there to help, that's a creative answer too. Well, one of the things that would have helped you, if I would have said, hey, guess what we're going to do? We're going to draw a house and it's going to have two windows and a door and then we have a tree and it's going to have a bird's nest. If I would have given you all the directions like you're, you're talking about, the full explanation up front is what Sue just said. If I would have done that, your expectations would have been one of, oh, I see where we're going with this. 
Well, that's one of the things that we see. Thank you for all your answers. That's one of the things that we see with generations is it's the expectations. It's that piece of what do you expect from someone else? And in this picture, the dog looking at the bacon, you know what that dog expects. <laughs> that dog expects that it's going to get some of that bacon. But what we see happening with generations is that we have this conflict. And on the screen, you'll see that um, the Society of Human Resource Managers took a survey, and they found that older workers said these things about the younger workers. They said they don't dress appropriately. They have poor work ethics. They're not formal enough. They need supervision. They don't use technology effectively. Now, before you get your hackles up, those of you that are in the younger generation, just know that this is what the younger workers said about their more seasoned colleagues. They said they're resistant to change, they don't recognize our efforts, they micromanage us, and they don't like technology. And so what we see is that it can cause some conflicts between the generations. Well, a lot of what it boils down to is our core values. Now, in the beginning, I ask the question of, what is something that you've done in your past that you've been proud of? And Laura, do you have those still up on your screen that you can tell us what some of those are? Robin, I was responding to another participant. What were you trying to focus on? Um, in the beginning, the question, yeah, the question, um, I couldn't see anyone's answers to that. Do you still have those uh, up on your okay. screen? Uh, I do. I can, I can read some of them to you. Uh, of the proud accomplishments? Uh -huh. uh, mentoring, mentoring an employee to, to prepare them to be promoted to a management job. Uh, 27 years volunteer time with a youth program. Professionally, it would be mentoring a few of my staff over the years that have gone on to be successful. Learning another language. Raising decent kids. Uh, good, let's see. good. Yeah. Good. Okay, good. Thanks Thank for my you, own Laura. college education. Oh, you're welcome. Yes, thank you. Okay, and so when we hear those, a lot of those things that are important to us come down to our core values. And it, it's what do we value that is important to us and how does that influence us? And many times the way that, it, the way that we were raised, the environment we were raised in, affects what those core values are. And interestingly, a lot of the things, as you're going to see that as we go through the generations, we didn't have any control over. It was what was going on in the world around us, but it shaped what those core values are. So one of the things I like to talk about is that, you know, if you and I met for the first time and I'm late, you don't have anything else to go on except for the behavior of me being late. But my behavior is just the tip of the iceberg because below that we see thinking and feeling. So for instance, my alarm clock goes off in the morning and I don't feel like getting up. But then I think I'm going to get fired if I don't go to my job. And so hopefully the time I get ready and get to work, that the feelings will then catch up with the thinking. But that influences the behavior that you see. But even deeper in that iceberg is what we're talking about with values and beliefs. So when the American Diabetes Association calls me and wants me to go to my neighbor's house and hand out the, the envelope and ask them for a donation, I almost always say yes. And the reason is my father had age onset diabetes. And granted, this is self-serving, but I want them to come up with a cure before I'm old enough to get age onset diabetes. And so my values and beliefs are seated in that. But what you see that I think and I feel and then my behavior is, because of those values and beliefs. And then deepest in the um, iceberg are our needs. And our needs are the Maslow hierarchy needs, you know, the ones where if we're hungry, we need to eat food. The ones we're going to focus on today are the values and beliefs that affect how we think and feel. Because when we look at how we work together in our in work environment, what we see and who we work with and the behavior we see is influenced by more than just what we see with that behavior, with their values and beliefs and how they think and feel. Um, and so one of the things somebody just asked about, will you all get copies of these slides? And yes, you will get copies of the slides, so you don't need to um, be writing all this down. You can just um, sit there and, and enjoy what we're talking about. So 
Um, in the description, you probably saw that there are, this is the first time in history that four generations have been working together, but you see five generations on the screen. So what, what we're going to see is that the traditionalists, a lot of them being older than 69, 70 years old, they are retiring. And then the Generation Z, who are the ones that are just graduating from college, they're just coming into the workforce. So we do have five generations working together. Now, Laura is going to put the poll up, and um, what she's going to ask you to put over on the right-hand side of the screen in the poll is you're just going to look at what year were you born, and if you'll just answer the question, um, and then she will give us the poll results so that we can see who it is that um, is in the audience today and then compare it to what the national averages are as to the percentage that are in the workforce. And so, Laura, how are we doing on getting answers to our poll? We are doing very well. We've still got a little over 20 people. Oh, we're just under 20 people who have not yet responded, so I'll give it, give it a couple more seconds. Okay, good. Anybody who hasn't answered, please go ahead and take a guess. What's your best guess? What year were you born? <laughs> That's right. Some of us have to think about it longer than others. Right. <laughs> it depends on how far away we are from that year that we were born, I think. Do some rough math. <laughs> That's right. Okay, right. so how did I'm we do there? I'm going to go ahead and close it. We have a handful of people who may, may be a little distracted, so I'm going to go ahead and close it. Okay. It'll take just a few seconds for the results to come in. Thanks, everybody, for your patience. We've got a lot of people online today. It's great to see so many of you on here, especially on such a beautiful day. One of the things that's interesting as we wait for those results to come up is that the Society for Human Resource Managers said that they see what's happening is that 85% of them believe that this generational conflict, this intergenerational differences is going to be something that affects the workforce even more in the future than what we see today. Okay, so if you all can see the, the poll results too, we see that we have mostly baby boomers in our audience today. And um, let me see, I can't really see the percentage, all oh, 44%, so not quite half are baby boomers, and then Generation X comes in next, and then Generation Y. Um, so we do not have any traditionalists on the phone today. But interestingly, if you look at the screen, you'll see that the blue is the percentage of the population that each of the the um, different generations are, and then the red is the percentage in the workforce, and that's almost exactly what our distribution is today. We don't have any of the Generation Z in the workforce, but I have a feeling that you might live with some Generation Z, and um, so, and you may live with some traditionalists too. So as you see that right now, baby boomers are still the largest percentage of the population, and then Gen X and Gen Y. Even though baby boomers are the largest percentage right now, you're going to see in a few minutes that one of the other generations by 2025 is going to be even more so than that. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through each of the generations. And I'm going to give you just a little bit of a history lesson because we need to do that as we talked about the values and beliefs piece um, as to what was going on in the world when these generations were brought up. So we're going to talk about the events that shaped who they are, what are the strengths of that generation, what motivates them, and what might they fear. And then any of the generations have a strength that if it's overused, it becomes a limitation. So we're going to talk about that. And then if you are that particular generation, how can you increase your effectiveness in the workplace? And then what do you need to do if you're working with someone who is one of those generations? So let's start off with the traditionalists. They're the ones that they're older than 60, about 69 years old. And I say about because if you look at different studies, they use different years of what year they were born before or after. And so there's kind of this cusp in between the two generations. And so just know, and, and I'll give you an example in a few minutes about how sometimes 
people take on the trends of the generation before or after them if they're right there on that cusp. But what we know about the traditionalists is they lived through the Great Depression, and they were defined by wars, World War II, the Cold War. They were also known as the wealthiest generation. And can you believe this was before frozen food, it was before credit cards or automatic dishwashers. And so they measure work ethic on timeliness and productivity, and they believe that promotions, raises, and recognition could, should come from their job tenure. They're willing to sacrifice their personal lives for work, and they really like the command and control leadership. They don't like these open and empowered environments, and they prefer one decision maker leading the company and to be told what to do by the leaders. So you can already see where we might have some conflicts. So what are their strengths? Well, they respect authority. They are loyal. They're loyal to the company. They're loyal to whoever's in the hierarchical structure above them. They follow rules and protocols. So what motivates them? They want to be respected. See, they feel like they have this work experience and they want others to recognize it because they've worked hard. And then what do they fear? Well, change is really hard for them because, see, they grew up in a world where there wasn't a lot of change, and today change occurs so quickly, and then, of course, not being respected. And so, like I said, each of the generations has a strength. If it's overused, it becomes a limitation. For them, it might be not being flexible and possibly being unwilling to bend the rules because it could stifle creativity for the other generations. And so a couple of ways that they can increase their effectiveness is reverse mentoring. And this works well, whether it be for traditionalists or baby boomers with the younger generations. So the reverse mentoring means that you pair them up and the older generation helps the younger generation possibly with communication skills. And the younger generation can help the older generation learn technology and then increasing their flexibility. Okay, so if you work with someone or live with someone who is a traditionalist, what can you do? Well, see, they're a type A personality. You know, they're driven, they're stressed, they like to be in charge. So if you can give them an opportunity to lead, of course, establishing a mentoring program, don't pressure them, gradually put in change, and um, they don't like change just for the sake of change. And then coaching them on their people skills. So even though they have good communication skills, what may happen with some of the younger styles is because they expect this command and control, it might alienate others and they just don't understand the effects that it can have on those younger generations. Their motto might be lead, follow, or just get out of my way. <laughs> okay, so next we have the baby boomers. So in 1946, America and the rest of the Allied powers blamed, claimed victory after World War II. The soldiers came home. The American economy found renewed strength in supplying the free world with goods to rebuild the economy. And people settled down. And they started having babies, lots and lots of babies. In 1946, birth rates rose sharply, beginning a steady increase that wouldn't subside for almost 20 years. So this is important because this generation has remained the single largest grouping of people at every stage of their lives and has dominated the national landscape the entire time. But times are changing and that could be difficult for the baby boomers. So they're somewhere between 50, not 51 and 69 years old. They were defined by that Beatles music the Vietnam War, some um, of the studies break down the baby boomers into before Vietnam War and after Vietnam War because they still had created different trends. They were defined by assass assassinations, President Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and then, of course, President Nixon's resignation. They believe that work ethic is measured in hours worked. The two things that really shaped this generation was it was the first generation that was raised on watching television. 
and they're united in consumerism. Matter of fact, you may have heard this one quote that don't trust anyone over 30. So the events of Nixon and Watergate created this skepticism. And so baby boomers were considered to be the me generation. They were the first generation to take a breather between childhood and adulthood to explore being young. They got married later, they had kids later, and they spent lavishly on themselves. But interestingly, they then became the we generation from the me to the we because they had all these social causes like they created the women's movement, the civil rights movement, and Vietnam War protests. So what we see is this um, dichotomy between being the me generation and being the we generation. And you'll see that a lot as we go through here with the baby boomers. One of the things that's really difficult for baby boomers is when they're working under a youthful supervisor is it is a constant reminder that they've failed to keep pace. So many times it seems that baby boomers are at odds with other generations. They're used to getting their way. Like I said a minute ago, they have been the largest number in the workforce, but that's changing and they're finding it tougher to get along like we see in this picture. So what are their strengths? Well, they are the ones that created the term workaholic. They're competitive. They are challenged by established practices. So what motivates a baby boomer? Well, the professional accomplishments and getting ahead in their career. They want to make a difference. See, they feel like they've, used, they've had all these years of experience and they want to use that on challenging product projects and to make a difference. And they are very goal-oriented. So what might they fear? Not being respected. And because they're competitive and they've had these largest numbers in history, they don't like to lose. And one of the big things that we hear with baby boomers is they're afraid they're getting old. They don't want to not be relevant. Now, motivational speaker friend of mine said in the front row of his audience, he had two girls sitting there. And the whole time they're typing on their telephones. And he's a baby boomer and he said he can't believe they weren't paying attention. How rude. So then when he took a break, he asked him, what do you all think of all this? And they said, oh, this is really good stuff. We have a colleague who couldn't come today. She had to stay back at the office. And so we're taking turns texting her your key points. He said he was so glad he didn't say, why aren't you all paying attention? But that's one of the concerns of baby boomers is they're so afraid that they are going to not be relevant. And so um, what, are their, what are their strengths that are overused that could become limitations? Well, their lack of flexibility. And that workaholic comes up again because, yes, it can become a problem, especially with some of the younger generations who don't value that. So if you're a baby boomer, how can you increase your effectiveness? Well, what the younger generations say about baby boomers is they go on and on and on, whether it's in an email or a text or on a voicemail. So they're telling baby boomers, can you make it brief? Of course, learning technology and then increasing their flexibility and tolerance of some of the other um, generations. Okay, so. If you're working with a baby boomer, what's the best way to do that? Well, be sure and recognize their achievements. And if you can help them with challenging projects that make a difference, that's important. And respecting their experience. And then, like I said, there's that personal conflict. They, they have this competitiveness in individual, but they want to be part of the team. And so recognizing that and helping them see that the whole team can be successful. So what their motto might be, it, it, it's how long you play the game that matters. The more time you put in, the better. And you're going to see how that may be a problem with some of the other generations. So now we're going to talk about Generation X, who they're 36 to 50 years old. So on the upper left-hand side of your screen, if you can grab your box or your circle or your rectangle, and I want you to look at this list on the screen, and which of these one, which one item on the screen do you think does not describe a Gen X? So if you grab your square or your circle or rectangle, or and if you have a Macintosh, 
um, it may not let you grab that, so you might have to grab your pencil or your arrow. So whatever you can grab. Which one of the things on the screen does not describe a Gen X? Okay, so Laura, are you seeing any of the um, answers? Not yet. Let me see here. I wonder if we need to allow them to annotate. Cannot Anyone grab else? anything. Yeah, Not so you one might one need to, one well, you know what, I may need to give you control back here. Um, I'm giving you control back, Laura, so if you can allow them to annotate on the screen, please. Is it allowing you? I'm working on that just a moment, please. Okay. So those of you, thanks for your patience here as, as we look at the, the things on the screen okay. that describe Gen X. You all should be allowed there to do go. that now. There we go. Yay! Yay, okay, good. So, Carol, if you'll give me back control. Oh, good, okay. So, um, we're getting answers that are all across the board here. Wow, good. Wow, very bright screen. Good job. Okay, so we've got them pretty much across the board, but you know what? I'm thinking that, um, Okay, so I think the two that are getting the most answers are the highest volunteer rate and foodie. So thank you all for participating. I'm glad we've, we've got you all on the screen now. So if you said foodie, foodie is the one that does not describe a Gen X, and, but it does describe one of the other generations, and we will talk about that in just a minute. So what shape then is that it was an environment without war. So they're one of the first generations that grew up without a specific war. Um, they were raised on VCRs and the beginning of video games. And they do have the highest volunteer rate. And um, right now, traditionalists volunteer more than the general public, but Gen X has pretty much taken over that. And if attendance is the criterion, Gen X is the best educated generation in United States history. However, college graduation rates are not any higher than they were for previous generations. So Gen X re rejects the traditional work patterns because they saw their parents who felt like, oh, I need to pay my dues, and they put in their time, and they'd be at the company long term and get a retirement. But they saw their parents right-sized, downsized, and outsized. So what Gen Xers said is, I'm not going to put in the time that way. I want to see results now. And so a lot of times they only invest for the short term. So what might we see strengths? Well, they're the first generation to develop ease and comfort with technology. They were the latchkey kids. So they became self-reliant and learned how to be multitaskers. They are relationship builders. Okay, so what are Gen X's motivated by? They love this casual, friendly work environment, which you can see that could be a problem with traditionalists and baby boomers who don't value that. They're the first generation, too, that needed feedback, that they got participation awards they, for just showing up. And so they still need that immediate and ongoing feedback. And they like this non-traditional, informal, flexible work pattern. Especially they value their family time. Somebody who's an, uh, working in an accounting firm said that they could not get Gen Xers to stay through tax season because they need to work long and hard and they can't have their family time. And so they're looking for ways, how do we um, bridge that gap there? And social change is important to them. So what they fear are the rules, the rules that the traditionalists and the baby boomers set. Don't micromanage a Gen X. They mistrust baby boomer values. See, they feel stuck in the middle. So there's older workers they feel like are refusing to retire, and younger ones who they think are treated far better than they ever were, and they don't like that hierarchy. So their strength overused that could become a limitation is that carpe diem attitude. 
You know, Gen X, sometimes you might have heard that they're defined as slackers, but they just believe, enjoy the day, and don't worry about the future. They can be over-reliant on technology, and of course, they need this constant feedback. So, if you're a Gen X, how can you increase your effectiveness? Well, having some flexibility when you do need to work long hours and sticking with projects for the long term and knowing that the other generations might honor these rules more and figure out a way to work within that. So if you work with Gen Xers, what do you need to do? Well, don't micromanage them. Give them options, options in the task they do or the challenges or the new processes. They can have clear goals but give them latitude on how to achieve those goals. And they need instant rewards. Don't give them hopes of a future payoff like a promotion. That does not work well for Gen X. Instead, what can they have right now that's an instant reward for them working hard? So their motto might be, work smarter, not harder, so they can enjoy more time with their family. Okay, so now let's talk about the Gen Y, they have been the most researched of all generations. So they've been called, you probably heard, millennials, the net generation, the trophy generation, the Peter Pan generation, because remember Peter Pan didn't want to grow up, or the overscheduled generation. So when we look at, um, we've got this next poll, and so Laura, if you'll get this poll ready. Um, so as we look on the screen, if you look at these five things, which one of them do you think is less than 10 years old? So if you'll just choose one which you believe is less than 10 years old on the poll over on the right-hand side. <laughs> You're loving the right on the screen. <laughs> so if you can answer on the poll over on the right-hand side of the screen. <laughs> we do, Robin, we do have a good number of people in it. It's picking up. I think they needed a moment just to think about it, although it's a good okay. identity. But we've got, got, I'll give it about 10 more seconds, so go ahead and answer the poll as well, even though we love that you're using the annotation tools now that you've got them. <laughs> I know. It's fun, it's fun to write on the screen. <laughs> we love it. Okay. All right, we've got about five more seconds. Still got answers coming in. <laughs> none of them. <laughs> <laughs> right. so, so we didn't give an answer of none of them. So somebody's saying none of them. All right, I have closed the poll and we'll have the results in just a moment. Okay. And, and so come. Carol, if you, or uh, Laura, if you can hand control back over to yep. me. Oh, somebody I said all of them are older than 10 years. Okay, here, so here come the results. Here okay. come the results and I'll pass it back to you. Okay, so okay. what we're seeing is that most people are saying that it was Twitter and you are exactly right. Um, as you see on the screen, not much more than, than uh, not, less, not much less than 10 years, because Twitter was 2006. But isn't it amazing as we look on the screen and see YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, MySpace, I mean, it's just 12 years. I mean, just in a mere 12 years, and that's where we've come with social media. But this is the, all that Gen Y has known. This has been their whole life, because the Internet became public 24 years ago. And even the oldest of this generation was still a kid at 12 years old. So um, they're 21 to 35 years old. Of course, they're raised on the Internet. CDs and DVDs were important. The Xers were the latchkey kids, but the Y is considered the most parented generation in history. They are really focused on serving and helping. And by 2025, 75% of the workforce will be Gen Y. So I told you that right now baby boomers are the largest. It will be Gen Y by then. So what are their strengths? Well, they're team-oriented because you can imagine they have zillions of friends on social media. They demand corporate social responsibility. 
They want to believe who they're working for is socially responsible. They're open to change. That's what they've seen their whole life. What motivates them? Fulfilling and meaningful work and, of course, building relationships. And they're multitaskers also. And, of course, they're motivated by technology and they really need positive reinforcement. So what do they fear? That dreaded nine to five work day. And FMO, fear of missing out because, see, they see everything that's going on on social media. Their financial security, but interestingly, not job security. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. They don't want to be a seat filler. They want a meaningful job, and they fear this monotonous work and wasted time. So their strength overuse that could become a limitation, that's the piece, the job hopping, where the job security is not important to them. Some call it experience hoppers because if it's something that they feel like is a, a good experience, they will stay. So creating a good experience, something that will keep them engaged, it's fun. They can be overconfident. They have a lack of fear about keeping their job. And so they're um, outspoken, we will say, and unafraid of their boss. They have even been described as egotistical and brash. I was interviewing someone and she knew that I had taken these pictures and posted it on the company Facebook page. And she said, these pictures are awful. They are just so blurry. And when I asked if she was a photographer, she said, no, but I hope to buy a camera soon. So it creates this overconfidence that um, they are very outspoken. But for them, they feel like they're being honest. They're doing what they see on social media. And um, so they can be high maintenance. You also saw on that first screen, WHY, the Y generation. And so that piece can make some people say that they're a little bit high maintenance. Okay, so if you're a Gen Y, how do you go about increasing your effectiveness? Well, perspective. When a Y looks at where they want to be in their career and where they want to enter into the job market, they sometimes they don't realize it's taken other generations a long time to build the skills to get there. Having patience with managers so that they can earn the trust by staying and um, staying there for longer and developing face-to-face -face relationships because we know they're using their technology. Okay, so if you work with a Gen Y, what do you need to do? Well, answer their questions honestly. Listen to them. Share your expectations with them and help them manage their expectations. Don't be overbearing and directive with them. They need instant feedback just like they would get if they sent you a text. They need feedback instantly, a like on Facebook. That's what they're used to and making work a game. Okay, so their motto might be, all that matters in the game is how much fun it is. The more excitement, the better. Okay, so let's talk about the last generation. This is Gen Z. So this that you see on the screen, this is all that's ever known is technology. They have grown up from the time they were babies with technology. So I want you to, over on the right-hand side of your screen by your name where you see the check and the X, if you know who any of these people are on the screen, if you can put a check by your name, and if you don't know who they are, put an X by your name. So over on the right-hand side, just underneath the, the participants, if you can just, okay, so I see one person there who doesn't know, okay, doesn't know. If you'll just use your tools over on the right-hand side, good, good. Okay, so some of your exit on the screen, which is fine. Um, you can put X's on the screen. So do we see anybody that knows who they are? Oh, there's one person who does know. Okay, Bill knows who they are. All right, so thank you for your participation. Who they are, the first one on the left is Mosiah. At nine years old, he went on Shark Tank and he was creating bow ties. He created a $150,000 business. In the middle, we see Adora. She did a TED Talk when she was 11 years old, and she has gotten over 3 million views. And then Logan, also at 11 years old, has a TED Talk that has over 5 million views. What you're seeing on the screen is not the exception for Generation Z. It is the rule. This is what we're seeing with Generation Z. They're comfortable with technology. 
they have a mouthpiece to be able to talk about what they believe in, and they want to be able to do it. So they're 20 and younger, although I was training someone who was 23, and she showed a lot of these characteristics of Gen Z. So I think that there um, is a cusp there. These are the children of Generation X. They have, their life has been defined by terrorism. They don't know a time without terrorism. They lived through the Great Depression, a uh, recession of 2008, and then, of course, all of the social media with iPod and Facebook. They feel like that they're going to have to solve some of the worst environmental, social, and economic problems that the previous generations have created. Okay, so grab your pencil or whatever you can grab on the upper left-hand side of the screen. What do you think the attention span is of the Generation Z? Is it one second, eight seconds, a minute, eight minutes? Um, so grab whatever you can up there. Okay, so we're getting a lot of eight seconds. Oh, we've got a minute. We've got, okay, so we're getting, okay, but nobody's voting for eight minutes. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> okay, well, good. Well, for those of you that um, chose eight seconds, that is how long the attention span is. Although, some say they have eight-second filters, and in eight seconds, they'll decide after they sort and assess the information if it's worthy of their attention, and if so, they'll be focused on that. So they are highly connected. Um, they're used to instant gratification. Interestingly, they develop their personalities and life skills in this socioeconomic environment of chaos, uncertainty, volatility, and complexity. I mean, think about the blockbuster movies, The Hunger Games and Divergent. They depict teens being slaughtered. It's no wonder that Generation Z developed coping mechanisms and, you know, a certain resourcefulness. So their strengths. They not only care about the world but each other because they've seen it. They've seen it on the Internet. They've seen it on social media. Of course, they're highly connected. They process information at lightning speed. Some say that they're smarter than we were at their age. Others say it's just the way that they process information. And they do have an affinity and respect for the elderly. So what motivates them? Next, 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 next. Acceleration. Things really fast. I was training a new employee and I had a list of items. And every time I'd say one, she'd hop up and run over to look at it. And I thought she was just hyperactive, ADHD. But after studying this, what I realized was she just needed to be hands-on. She needed to be doing it as opposed to hearing about it. Of course, social entrepreneurship for a better world, they're motivated by. They need managers who will teach them because they're used to being taught on the Internet and by electronic media. They work best with a small work group, but they've got to have a strong peer leader. They work best with short-term re rewards, but they need to be rewards that are negotiated with them ahead of time that it's something that they want. So what their fears are, their pressure to succeed, they um, need to know what is expected of them, and they feel like a lot is expected of them. They worry about everything, the economy, the cost of things, their parents' job security, and, of course, FMO, fair move, missing out. So what are their strengths over use that can become a limitation? Well, their instant gratification, they, they can become impatient. Of course, their reliance on devices. Um, interestingly, they create social media personas that filter out their flaws. Um, they, it's been said that the cigarette of the 21st century is the chair because they are so inactive. And then, um, of course, they're face-to-face -face social skills and they need constant feedback. They have not learned how to receive negative feedback, and so we need to help them with that. Okay, so if you're a Gen Z, how can you increase your effectiveness? Learning to write without emoticons and emojis is a big one. Turning off the devices and interacting in person. Okay, so if you work with a Gen Z or you live with one, how can you do that better? Well, snackable content, like you would write in a text. You know how a text only has one subject, so snackable. T 
talk, don't talk down to them. Talk to them as adults. And I said one of the generations was foodie, a foodie. Well, they are a foodie, so you can feed them. They need to be entertained with puzzles and surprises and games and open communication training um, also can help them and control of their workspace and their schedule is important. Their motto might be do something, anything, and then post it on social media. <laughs> Okay, so as you look at the screen, now that you've heard about all the different generations, which generations do you think have the most difficulty getting along? So if you'll use your arrow up on the upper left-hand side of the screen, which generations do you think have the most difficulty getting along? Okay, so a lot of you are saying baby boomers with Gen X. Um, baby boomers with Gen Y and Z is getting a lot too, okay. But I, I think most of you are saying baby boomers with Gen X. Okay, well interestingly, baby boomers complain that Ys and Zs are easily distracted and lack discipline, focus, and commitment. Although Ys and Zs, you believe that boomers are sexist, defensive, and sensitive, resistant to change, and lack creativity. Boomers. Now you do complain about Xers that you that they lack also like discipline, focus, and are distracted. And Gen Xers, you tend to agree with Ys and Z's description of boomers that you believe um, that they are sexist, defensive, and sensitive. But you also believe that Ys and Z's are arrogant. And then we have Ys and Z's. You believe that Xers have poor problem-solving skills and are generally slow to respond. But we do see the most difficulty getting along is baby boomers with Ys and Zs, and you could see why that happened um, as we went through the different areas. Okay, so it, what it's doing is causing one in five of us to waste about five hours a week on intergenerational conflicts. So what can we do? I like to use this trust model. It's really simple. It's got four areas, reliability, acceptance, openness, and straightforwardness. Reliability, I do what I say I'll do. Acceptance, who you are is okay with me. Openness, you're willing to give and receive feedback, and then straightforward. I say what I mean, and I mean what I say. Okay, so if you look at those four areas, if you'll grab a hold of your pencil or your highlighter, which one of these areas do you think is the key to all the other areas in the trust model? Which ones do we have to have? Okay, good, good. We've got. Um, Okay, good. Openness, acceptance, good, good. Okay, good job. So all across the board. So if you think about a trusting relationship, you probably know that you have all of those areas. But the one that is the most important and key to all the other ones is acceptance. Acceptance does not mean that you're accepting bad behavior from another person, but it means that you're accepting them for who they are no matter what generation they're, that they are and how that they were raised and what those values and beliefs are, you accept them for who they are. Because what that can do is help us get to the heart of the generation gap. And so this is the key piece that um, I think is the thread that weaves through. Traditionalists, they volunteer twice as much as the regular, as the general population. Boomers. They get involved in grassroots volunteering, but they certainly want to use the skills they've used all these years to develop. Gen Xers, they have the highest participation rate right now. And they don't want to change the world, but they just want to fix it. They're very philanthropic. Then we have the Gen Ys. They want to be able to give back to the community. Matter of fact, Gen Y is so concerned with corporate social responsibility that they will choose to go to work for an organization based on whether they have community involvement, social projects going on. Even if they're not the type of volunteers, they will choose their job based on that. And then Gen Z, what we see with them is that the volunteering has trended upwards. So what we know happens when the generations come together in giving back in opportunities to volunteer that the younger generations, X, Y, and Z, are able to practice leadership development, relationship development, coaching skills, team building skills in an environment that they're not going to be evaluated like they would at work. 
It also gives baby boomers and traditionalists a chance to work together with them in creating some common ground to get to the heart of the generation gap. So how do we close the gap? Well, we talked about reverse mentoring and how important that was to pair an older employee with a younger one, the acceptance. That is one of the key pieces, accepting where they are, using what we learn today, accepting that, and then figuring out how do we work together. And then, of course, for purpose opportunity. All right, so um, on the right-hand side of the screen, we will have a poll, and I'm going to go right past that um, so that we won't write on the screen. But, Kara, but um, Laura, if you can put that poll up on the side of the screen, and it's just asking, you know, what things have you learned today? But while we're doing that, in the interest of time, if you have any questions, if you can type them into the chat box, or, Laura, if you've seen any questions come up as we go through that you would like me to answer. Yes, we do, actually. Let me ask a few questions. I'm pulling this up while where people are answering the question. A couple of questions. Good. Yes. Um, So, yes, you can go ahead. I, I, no, there's the, the results. So, yeah, pretty evenly um, with some appreciating the strengths of the generation and understanding them. And um, so, great. Thank you all for responding to the poll. So, 
Laura, you can take it away. Oh, I like the smiley face and the mustache. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Robin, for your time today. And thanks, everybody, who joined us. If you have just a moment, I'll run through a couple of things with you. I hope you've gotten some good information from this session and a chance to ask some questions. Just a reminder that this webinar has been approved for one hour of general recertification. Oops, excuse me. One hour of general recertification credit hours toward California, GPHR, HRBP, HRMP, PHR and SPHR recertification through the HR Certification Institute. You will receive a certificate in about three weeks confirming your participation today. Uh, I do want to once again thank uh, the Trustmark Foundation, our sponsor, for making this webinar possible. Our deepest thanks for your support. Thank you everyone who joined us today. And please keep an eye out for an invitation to next month's webinar, which will be on August 19th that will be led by LFGSM career coach Deborah Sekulares called Stand Out, Elevate Your Profile for Promotion. Please look for your registration link for your set to this session. Uh, once again, for those of you who may not have heard this at the very beginning, you'll be receiving a link to a survey in a little while. We do take your feedback into serious consideration when looking for new topics and speakers for the series. They help us to continually improve our sessions. Also included in that email will be a link to today's recorded session, as well as the slides you viewed today. This will be an email coming from Natalie Corrado on our staff. With that, we'd like to thank, we'd like to end the session, wish you a productive rest of your day, and thanks for joining us.